Julian was especially interested in a compound called progesterone. New ways of controlling fertility have begun to suggest... Discovered in 1934, progesterone was called the pregnancy hormone because it plays a central role in preparing a woman's uterus for childbirth. Apparently, Mrs. Julian had had a couple of miscarriages and doctors at that time had found that progesterone was essential to carrying a child to term. The pain's getting harder. In the 1930s, nearly one out of every six pregnancies in America ended in miscarriage or premature birth. You relax. Your baby is almost here now. Hundreds of thousands of babies were lost each year. <coughs> Julian realized that progesterone offered new hope. He and other chemists began looking for ways to make the hormone for pregnant women at risk. Progesterone is one of a class of compounds called steroids, which scientists were just beginning to realize played many key roles in the body. They were involved in reproduction. They were involved in sexual development. They were involved in the response to injury and growth. And yet, despite this enormous range of different physiological effects, these compounds all seem to have similar chemical structures. The group of molecules that we call steroids all share a common framework composed of these four ring systems right here. Six-membered ring fused to a second six-membered ring, fused to a third six-membered ring, fused to a five-membered ring. Dozens of steroid molecules are made by the body, ranging from cholesterol to digestive fluids to sex hormones such as progesterone and testosterone. The anabolic steroids used by some athletes today are simply modified forms of the natural male hormone. Once it was recognized that the family of materials we call steroids had such an impact on human health, there became a global push can we get these materials? Can we make them available? And what sources do they come from? Chemists first tried isolating steroids from animal extracts like horse urine. But the process required vast amounts of raw material and yielded only tiny amounts of steroids. The breakthrough in making steroids available was the realization that you could take substances from plants that could form the starting point for the synthesis of steroids that would give you a leg up on the process. In the mid-1930s, scientists had discovered that plants have steroids too, with the same four carbon rings found in animal steroids. It was only a very small leap to realize that one could convert a plant steroid into an animal steroid. The idea that plants made chemicals similar to human steroids was something Julian already knew. Back at DePaul, while researching physostigmine, Julian had set aside a dish of calabar bean oil. A few days later, he found white crystals in the oil. Searching the literature, he found that these crystals were a plant steroid called stigmasterol. Small amounts of stigmasterol were also found in soybean oil, and Julian now had plenty of that at Glidden. He was confident that he could convert it into progesterone if he could find a way to extract this stigmasterol from the oil. But Julian was not the only one who saw the potential of making steroids from plants. In 1938, a chemist named Russell Marker found a way to convert steroids from sarsaparilla root into progesterone by chemically snipping off the side chain of extra atoms from the plant steroid. It was breakthrough chemistry. But progesterone made from sarsaparilla root was too expensive to be practical. The race was on for a cheaper source. I think that both Percy Julian and Russell Marker understood the medical implications of what they were trying to do. That they knew if those natural products could be provided in quantity, that the face of medicine would be changed. Marker published paper after paper documenting his search for a plant that would yield cheap progesterone. 
Julian saw his chance slipping away. There wasn't much time for this kind of research amid the daily demands of his job. One day the phone rang. The fellow said, Doc, something's happened. Some water's leaked into soybean oil tank number one and it's spoiled. Spoiled? I said, spoiled? No, what, what do you mean, spoiled? Now, you understand, this tank contained 100,000 gallons of refined soybean oil bound for the Durkee famous foods plant. And if it were ruined, Glidden would be out $200,000. And such a blunder might cost me my job. So I was over there in a jiffy. <laughs> Julian found the giant tank fouled with white sludge. But his despair vanished in a flash of recognition. There were crystals in the sludge at the bottom of the tank. They were stigmasterol, the same crystals he'd found in the dish of calabar oil. Now he realized what had forced the stigmasterol out of both oils, water. You couldn't destroy a 100,000 gallon tank of soybean oil to get this steroid out. But when you add a little water to it, it falls out, it precipitates, you can, it separates on its own. And it was this little accidental discovery, the kind that characterized the development of science so often, that led to a practical method for the isolation of steroids from soybean oil. Now, a step ahead of marker, Julian developed an industrial process for converting stigmasterol into progesterone in bulk. Julian did not discover the primary chemistry that took stigmasterol over to progesterone. That came out of a German group five years earlier. But he was the first person to realize that it could be scaled up. A company that's in the paint business suddenly becomes a player in the human sex hormone game. In 1940, Julian sent a one pound package of progesterone to the Upjohn Pharmaceutical Company. Shipped under armed guard and valued at nearly $70,000, it was the first commercial shipment of an artificial sex hormone produced anywhere in America. Testosterone and other artificial sex hormones soon followed, bringing millions of dollars in unexpected revenue to Glidden. Despite his growing stature, Julian was barred from a major hormone conference held at an exclusive resort in Maryland. Only after three days of protest by his white colleagues was he finally admitted. Within a year, Julian would face a new challenge. His rival, Russell Marker, had discovered a giant yam in Mexico. It was even richer in steroids than soybeans. In 1944, Marker and two partners formed a company called Syntex to make hormones from the yam. For the rest of the decade, Syntex and Glidden would produce most of the world's supply of artificial sex hormones. I think the decision to make substances like steroids from plants rather than from animal tissues was a landmark in the history of medicine as well as the history of chemistry. It meant that you could take steroids that before were so rare that you barely knew what they were, and you could inject them into animals or people and see their effects on a variety of conditions. The possibilities that that opened up almost were limitless. The work of Julian and Marker would lay the foundation for a whole new class of medicines, including the birth control pill and a wonder drug that would soon take the world by storm. By the mid-1940s, Julian's work at Glidden had won him national acclaim. With the outbreak of World War II, his alpha protein became the chief ingredient in bean soup a firefighting foam credited with saving thousands of servicemen's lives. He was even featured in Reader's Digest, one of America's most popular magazines. It was the beginning of white America's exposure to Dr. Percy Julian and how 
he had to fight to overcome the odds of being a black man in America. And in the context of the times, it made him a symbol. Here was a person who looked like me, who was not only in the field, but succeeding magnificently at the top of his profession. That was profound. Julian was named to the boards of half a dozen colleges and universities. He was showered with awards and honorary degrees and sought after as a public speaker. The NAACP awarded him its prestigious Spingarn Medal, previously given to W.E.B. Du Bois, George Washington Carver, Paul Robeson, and Thurgood Marshall. And the Chicago Sun-Times named him Chicagoan of the Year. 